This though is your persona, right? I would call this is your persona. Uh, so th three things, the, the red socks, why do you wear, and not the same pair as you pointed out, okay? You do, <laughs> change, you do change your socks every once in a while. So why the red socks? Well, the red socks goes back to, to my years in London. And uh, I remember once I was having dinner in, mm -hmm. in a beautiful club in Pall Mall, and uh, I was sitting next to, to a person who, whom I really love, I have to say. A very old, very posh uh, British surgeon. And, uh, and he always wore red socks. He always had red socks since I could remember. So at some stage, I remember asking, finding myself asking, Charles, can I ask you, why do you wear red socks all the time? And then he replied with a very posh British accent and he said, oh, oh, my dear son, you are never going to see a dead man with red socks. <laughs> and I like it so much. They said, you know what? You're right. And in fact, you know, red socks, it's kind of giving a sort of a very diabolic pleasure. Maybe you are, sometimes you are incredibly formal. You are in the middle of an examination or very important moment of your career, but inside you know that you're wearing red socks. And it's kind of make you laugh inside. It's, it's, it's a sort of a declaration of freedom, if you want to say so. I feel it sometimes like when I'm talking with a woman and I'm thinking, what if she would maybe have a very sexy lingerie down there and nobody knows? But I'm no, sure oh, you're, you're married. married. You're married. You can't talk about that. So, like, I was wondering when I saw it, though, and, like, are you concerned that instead of going up, you're going down when your time has come because at least if you're wearing red socks they'll recognize you you're one of the you're well, one of the group i'm not sure uh, and at the moment i'm not quite sure where you actually go afterwards okay. Okay. what is important is what you do in the meantime and in the meantime so far it's extremely good to wear red socks although i'm considering now to change colors occasionally but i think i will stick to purple purple, purple. royalty purple. you came yeah. from yeah like you came like britain was a huge influence in your life, obviously. I, we'll tell that story in a second, but you go to Turin. How far is Turin from Pisa? Two hours and a half, three hours. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so basically Turin is like the Savile Row of Italy. Is that what it is? No, well, I would say Naples is the Savile Row of, of Italy. But, but in fact, my tailor is from Naples, but he's based in Turin a town that I both love. I both love Na Naples and Turin. So I, I go to him because he's really a maestro. So when, when we are together, we designed the, the suit together and we choose the fabric and then and then every, all the process starts. And uh, he's really a maestro. So you only wear Xenia, from what I understand? You're exclusive? No, I don't wear Xenia. I wear just, you know, very uh, things that are tailored made for me. I'm not into brand, I'm into specificity and uniqueness well, no. that, that sounds so arrogant i'm sorry, sorry. okay so, i mean but no, no brioni nothing well brioni is beautiful but i wish i could afford some of the pullover of brioni but but uh no well not really all the things you see now have been designed for me and okay i have i have to ask a favor that's enough with this i can't yeah. wear ties i hate it that. That. <laughs> goodbye um so the question as well is how did you find this guy by the way i mean like there's like italy is known for its clothes but two and a half hours away you found this gentleman how was this i was lecturing in turin and a very good friend of mine told me and and i was mentioning the fact that he had a wonderful jacket very napolitan you know napolitan jackets are the one that you see are kind of very soft on the shoulder it kind of goes down Oh, okay. Different from a British dress, a British dress will be reinforced here, will be straightened. Uh, and I liked it so much, and I told him, uh, where is your tailor? And uh, the guy was from Naples, and he said, you wouldn't believe it, but he's, he's actually here. He's in, in Turin. And then we went, and we talked, and we liked each other. And since then, I always made my dresses. Uh, so what's interesting is we were talking a bit before your passion currently with Be Queen 33 and other things that you're doing is communication. So I'm, I'm sort of looking at this, the way people project their brand or their personal brand or their image, this sort of thing. I mean, we'll talk about this in a bit, but 
it seems to me that from the time you went to England and possibly before, you created a persona. Is that true? Well, I'm not sure if I created a persona. What, what I think is that I really believe that the point of each one is to find your own voice. You, know, you, you grow up and by growing up, you little by little, you exclude all the noises of the things that yourself and maybe your society have put on you and, and you develop your persona. And by developing your persona, you actually find your voice. And I know very much with my voices. My voice is communicating, it's reaching out. I create bridges. That's what I do really. And uh, so by all my all the aspects of my life, whether it's dressing, whether it's working, whether it's delivering a lecture, whether it's treating a patient, is about uh, creating a bridge, is about uh, communicating. So at some stage I realized, I, I had the, the honor to be the director of a master of management and marketing in dentistry. That was five, six years ago. And uh, I've learned with expert in communication, that in fact, communicating is something that you can teach, you can pass, and you can help everyone. So uh, my the goal of Be Queen 33, which is really my spin-off, was to, to support all the dentists that are asking us uh, to be mentored, to be coached, but most importantly, to develop their own digital marketing or even their marketing. The way they communicate, of course, can. When I see a website, of a dentist and I see the logo with the molar shape and the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the page of oh. I lost you Filippo you froze uh, let me tell you that you froze oh that's not good Filippo, are you frozen? There we go. And you're back. And you're back. Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm back. I don't know what happened. I, I was saying, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I, I said each patient really is different from the other as well. So there is always the right dentist for that patient, but, but they need to know. Patients need to know. And, and dentists as well. The majority of my colleagues cannot really justify why a patient should choose themselves instead of another guy with the dental practice in the same road. I think that is crucial, understanding why you're different from the rest of the world. So when we were talking before, it was interesting. You, you're moving towards Instagram on one level, but you said you said you have to know TikTok. And I kind of went, wait a minute, like you're the, are you the Sarah Cooper of Italy? Do you imitate like whoever the leader of Italy is? No, and, I, and I'm not even, and I'm not on TikTok as a disclaimer. Oh, okay, as a disclaimer. Okay. But what I'm saying is that once again, it's important to understand whom, whom you're speaking to. Right. For example, as a periodontist, I'm talking to people between 35 and 50, 55. Right. In fact. But if I would like to move into aesthetic and cosmetic dentistry, maybe my my public will be even younger. So let's imagine that I want to target orthodontists. Maybe I might uh, ortho treatment. Maybe I might even move to then choose a channel that is fitting your public. Therefore, TikTok makes sense. But of course, if you want just to place implants and making over dentures, then not even Facebook is enough for you. You need to yeah. move a doctor. So you target communication according to your objectives, for sure. Interesting. So what is B Queen 30? I mean, I'm just looking at the logo right now. I mean, you're very clever. Health care revolution, which is kind of neat. You blended the two words by going from RE is yellow, the queen bee, uh, 33, and the reverse, the E and the 33. I mean, this is pretty cool. I mean, did you design this or did you work with somebody? It was actually my team all together with the graphic designer that we worked actually was last summer, mm -hmm. like June, July. Well, the, the queen, the bee queen, the queen bee for me is important. And I love bees. I cherish them. And I think they're the most, one of the most important animals that we have, because what I like about bees that they fly, but they're extremely organized. And the work yeah. is, mm -hmm. and at the same time, they're capable to build 
amazing things by um, using the same structure, but most importantly, they transform. So they take something from the flowers and they get down to the to honey and actually also helps the other flowers to, to be pollinated. Yeah. So uh, the bees are, I think, one of the most symbolical uh, animals, well, insects that actually I, I know. Eh? And I like, of course, the, the queen bee because it's, it's kind of, you know, kind of leading the entire story. Now, 33 is my favorite numbers, not for any Christian reason, but it's, it's a very symbolical numbers. But in, in, in Italy as well, 33 is a number that is associated to health because in the old times when a pneumologist you know, was obscuring the, the, the chest, would ask the patient to say 33, which is 33, because the tr tr is, is a sound that, that you know, to hear the lungs better. So that was the reason for the 33. There are different reasons. Of course, I could talk like half an hour about this logo, but. Uh, Go ahead. I love it. I mean, no. graphic, graphic this. I mean, it's a graphic. That's why you said if you looked at 100 websites in North America, every one of them has a tooth, yeah. like some variation on a tooth. They're, the brand is not projected. I mean, you know they're a dentist, but you don't identify the dentist in terms of who he is. So everything, I mean, I've jumped the gun here. We're kind of at the end. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need somebody to go trente trente on my chest. I think I'm coming down with a cold. So it's, uh, it, it, I, and as I say, we jumped to the end only because I find this so fascinating. So did you take courses in a master? Oh, you got all kinds of masters and academia degrees. Did you, the neuro-linguistic programming, is this part of what you're doing? Well, I, I, we, we, I did lots of courses. And, and when I was directing that master's, I had this expert that actually worked on me. So it, communication works a little bit like psychoanalyst. Uh, yeah, basically, if you want to become a psychoanalyst, you need to receive the treatment as well. So I can help people in developing communication because I was helped in my communication. Since the very beginning, more than 10 years ago, I started to, uh, to talk to people that was into communication and, and branding and, and marketing, and I loved it. It was too late, of course, to change topics, but I merged the things that I was doing, you know, perio and dentistry and, and communication. I mentioned Alan Farber, who actually spoke to yesterday. This is the International Association of Dental Specialists, IADS, and he said something up similar although it's extremely robust, very complicated, but it's a way of um, uh, like specialists talking to specialists, training specialists um, in procedures. <clears throat> and one of the people that he just brought in was Ernesto Lee and his smart technique applies to periodontics. But I, I, I would very much like to put you in touch with him because I, I think the connection between what you're doing and what his uh, whole concept is, is, is extremely similar. And he's also going international, which is kind of exciting. So I think it would be a good fit. So I, let's go back to the beginning, because as I say, I went to the end first. Let you taking a picture of me? Wait, don't, don't. <laughs> so I want to go back to the beginning. So your grandfather and your father were both dentists. Yes, they were. In Pisa? Yeah. Yeah. The, funny enough, nobody has really worked with the, with the predecessor, but yes, they were, my, my, my grandfather opened his practice in 1946 in Pisa. Uh, yes, they, they were both dentists. And in a way, I always felt it as a sort of family tradition. Uh, and funnily enough, I always felt I wanted to be a dentist, but the summer that I was about to choose dentistry. When I get to the point of becoming a dentist, I realized that I really didn't want to be a dentist. I thought it was, I thought it was horrible, actually, to be honest, to be a dentist. You know, I, I wanted to change the world. I wanted to to do something that would have made the difference. Well, I love to say people making the difference, and I really understood what making the difference means. But I love when somebody tells me, you know, I want to make the difference. But but yeah, most I think most probably I wanted to make the difference, and I felt that dentistry wouldn't have really allowed me. But it's very difficult to get into dentistry in Italy, and. It was really like, when I did it, it was one out of 17 that would have made it. And, and of course I studied, but I didn't really, 
studied that much, to be honest. I'm, I, I wasn't really sure. My dream was to study history, medieval history that I always, wow. loved. I always loved history. And, and, but, but I made it. I arrived like only, the, only 20 were actually taken and I was 18th. So I made it. So everybody was looking at me like, what the hell? You have a dental practice and you're not going to dentistry since you entered. So I kind of felt, oh my God, everybody's telling me that I might be mad. I might be mad if I don't do it. So I, I went and I started dentistry. And at the beginning, it was incredibly depressing because that sounds so judgmental and so arrogant, but but I can, I'm, I'm very honest. So I want to tell you the, exactly the, the poor truth. I mean, the people next to me, seemed to have figured out everything. You know, They were telling me that it was such a great job, that you would earn money, that you would treat people. It was a stable and, and a job that would give you lots of satisfaction. And I found it so unromantic. I was thinking, oh my God, these people are 19 and they think about a job that would give you money? Shouldn't give us adventure of pleasure or, or passion. So I, in a very arrogant way, I consider myself not worthy of it. And, sorry. Uh, it's different. I felt myself I was too worthy for that, it was, which is horrible, I have to say, but that was a very mature approach. But the beginning was horrible. Then at some stage, a game changer. I studied neurophysiology and I felt in love with medicine. Mm -hmm. I really, the moment that you go in understanding the mechanisms behind a human being, I, I was fascinated. And since then, I started to study then I started to get good grades. And by getting good grades, I got more pleasure in studying. And so as a, as a snowball, as an avalanche, one thing led to another and end up we you know with the, of course, honors and I got my degree. And, and then I was very happy to be a dentist. Mm -hmm. Yet, I would still think that it was too little. So I, I said, okay, I will be a dentist, but I want to be a max fax. I want to be a maxillofacial surgeon. Right, right. So I went to do my PhD in maxillofacial surgery. Uh, and then after a while, I felt that I didn't like it that much. What, what, let me be clear. What I didn't like was the fact that when you are a surgeon, I'm also an oral surgeon. I also have a special right. name. So I know, I know the, let's say the, the people very well. An oral surgeon most of the time is focusing on the techniques and, and trust me, doing things, the dexterity of doing things is such a great pleasure. I mean, the pleasure that you have when you're working with your hands, it's wonderful. But after a while, I was more interested in understanding why you do things instead of how you do things. And, and for that, especially I got into regeneration and I discovered about this guy, Maurizio Tonetti, that was very much publishing and working a lot on regeneration. So Perio, that never really interested to me, I always found it very boring and too too precise, too picky. You know, I always wonder why these people are so intrigued by millimeters, you know, looks so little to me. But I wrote to the guy and, uh, and we started to exchange emails mm -hmm. in a very, very funny way because, you know, we <clears throat> and uh, I, I just asked him at some stage, you know, could I come to do like six months of my PhD in London? He was based in London at this one. Uh, and then he said, well, let's see if it's possible or not and, and blah, blah, blah. And that was like in the span of a month. Then I remember one day I wrote to him, I saw that they ran a master in Perry and I thought, well, it wouldn't be good and cool to be in London to, to study and to work. And, and I read that there was a master that was part-time, like you would stay six months there, six right. months at home. I remember that at home I had a girlfriend, I had a practice, I was working at the university. So I thought, well, maybe this kind of situation where you can do both could work. So I remember I wrote to, to Maurizio Tonetti and uh, asked him, you know, would I come maybe, would you consider me to, for the masters? And then he said, well, Filippo, we have a two years waiting list. And I said, oh, too bad. And I remember that he gave me an appointment. He said, you know, I'll be in Venice for this Congress, you know, come and we talk. And I remember I went there, but he didn't turn up. And I, you know, I was 25, 26, and I was so depressed that he didn't turn up because I wanted to talk to him so badly that I remember I spent all night walking and drinking in Venice as if, as if I would been left by a girlfriend or so. But three days afterwards, I remember I was in the gym and my dad called me and said, look, Tonetti just called you and he wanted to talk to you. And one second afterwards, he called me and he said, Filippo, as you know, we have a long waiting list. Yesterday, the master started for this year. 
but one of the residents, a girl from South Korea, got pregnant and didn't turn up. So if you want, the place is yours, but you have three days to be here. That was Friday, and on Monday morning I was in, uh, well, I left girlfriend, practice, my father, everything, and Monday morning I was in London. And that has been really miserable the first few months because I, yeah, I had no idea how to speak English. I had no knowledge, no house. I didn't know even how to iron a shirt. I didn't know really. I've always lived in my house. I had no money because nobody gave me anything because it was my decision. But after a few months, oh my God, it was me, 26 years old, alone in London. Oh my God. Yeah. So when, what, this was, hold on now, you're 46. 2001. 2001. So, so this was, hold on now. So this was like the late, the early 2000s, late 90s. It was nearly 20 years ago. Oh my God. That sounds so old, but yeah. I you're old, not. my friend. You're old. You got gray in your beard, my friend. That's right. I, I, need to, I need to jump in here for two seconds. I'm watching you. I love it. When I see you in the pictures, you're wearing those Italian collared shirts, but you're wearing a button-down shirt today. Like, no, it's not button down. It's oh, it's not button down. Oh, I thought it was button down. It's very New York, the button down, but I don't know. Okay. Very, very what? Very romantic. Very New York. Oh, very New York. Okay. It's, it's Brooks Brothers. <clears throat> There you go. This is what this is all about. I know. I know. Um, you're also wearing a pink strap, or is it pink or purple? Purple on your eye watch. Uh, no, it's actually it's kind of a lila, lilac. You know, it's oh, lilac. all right. But but now I'm getting very familiar to pink. I think I will move to things that are pinks. I like pink now. Pink socks, my friend. That is yeah, really it could cool. be an evolution. Yeah, it could. It and, could and always with a pocket square. I love it. Like. It's outrageous. You are well, like I love I love handkerchief. I found jacket without something. They look very boring to me. So I always put something inside. Yeah. But it's three days ago, no, yesterday we spoke on on WhatsApp, but we spoke before, and I just want to explain the beard for those who you know. And it has nothing to do with mine because yours only has a little gray. But you had a root end. You had surgery, yeah. endodontic surgery the other day. Yeah, I, I had an apicectomy here that was last week, and, and I was swollen the day afterwards. So I said, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shave, and and I didn't shave for three, four days. And I'm lucky enough to have a team of beautiful ladies next to me in the practice and and in Bee Queen, and, and, and everybody was so enthusiastic about the beard because now it's kind of fashion, and especially within the young young community. So they said, oh, prof, you should keep it, you should keep it. And I said, okay, well, let's keep it. And now I don't know what to do, whether I cut it or not. I mean, I would see it in the next few days, but but I kept it, and then they told me to keep it for the interview. So keep it for the. You have to set it at three point five on the beard shape. That that'll keep it for a while. So you've said a couple of things to me. I didn't I didn't mean to look away while we were talking, but I had to look up something because while you were in London, you were dating an actress. Yeah from Xena the Warrior. So I had to remember to look up Lucy Lawless. I couldn't remember the name, who was Xena, right? No, you... I, did, I, didn't, I didn't date Xena. As a no, 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 but did you meet her, Lucy Lawless? I haven't met her and uh, of course I cannot disclose who this person no, was. No, 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 no. But uh, no, I've never met any of the person that were involved with her professionally. She was the, an actress of, of the sitcom, but she didn't, uh, I mean, we never went on set because that was London. And, uh, yeah. So three, a couple of things have jumped out. And I, and I mean, I, I'm not being facetious, but you left the girlfriend in Italy. That seems to be very common for a lot of people that went to get advanced degrees. It's not the first time I've heard it. It's like, darling, I love you, but I'm not here. And I'm gone. You know, you're done. Right. That's so, that's so interesting. But what really um, I said to you before, what's fascinating is you're a chameleon. Right, you understand style, and w even in England, right? You're, you're. It's like it's like the caste system in India, right? Depending on how you speak, that sort of is your particular your strata. You know, if you speak posh English, you know, with the really with the really, you know Prince Charles and all that kind of stuff. So you you picked that up. That was part of what you did. You became English, right? I don't, I don't know. Let's say that I that I embrace the British culture, but okay. I'm very Italian. I'm very Italian, as you, I think, physically and even in terms of my the way I live life in general. But 
but I enjoy British culture dramatically. And I actually have to say that I found myself at home in London very much. And that was, some of my best friends are in fact British. You know, many Italians were going there and then recreating a community of Italian in London. Right. Which I really, I tried to be exposed on the contrary <clears throat> to other people. And, and actually there is so much misconceptions about, uh, about uh, Britons, I have to say. Uh, the, the people I met were incredibly warm-hearted and lovely people that really wow. made my life for the better. And, and what is beautiful, as you say, that the language is, in fact, it, your language, English language, is a beautiful language, extremely rich. Although the majority of the people just use a minor, tiny percentage right. Of, right. of the vocabulary. But, but when it's well-spoken, oh my God, how beautiful that is. And especially with the proper, proper accent. And, uh, yeah. Well, but it, once again, you mentioned I don't know. How did New York factor into this? How? You, how did New York? You were no, no way. I got it wrong. It's not. No, go ahead. You were going to tell me about New York. Chicago. Chicago. Chai Town. <laughs> Deep dish pizza. Right. I, I love Chicago. I really love Chicago. Is is because maybe he, he went into that because when we talked, I said exactly the same story about Chicago. I could live in Chicago all my life. It's a town that when I'm in there, I really feel I belong to. And, and I have so beautiful memories. You know, we went there many times. Once we went for the new classification of periodontitis. Right. And, uh, you know, it was an incredible atmosphere. You know, it was like 35 Europeans, 35 Americans, and 35 rest of the world. And of course, now as you, you can see, I have gray, gray beard, but I was 43. That was kind of very young in that meeting. So I really felt like, you know, going to a conclave, you know, a very important oh. moment. And, but the best thing was that we were in Chicago and one of my mentors, one of the person that I really valued and really influenced me the most was Bob Janko, the late Bob Janko, right. which unfortunately passed away this year, this horrible year of story of life. And, um, but I remember with Bob, another 20 senior periodontist hijacking a bus giving $50 <laughs> of tip to the bus driver, asking the guy to bring us to a blues bar. And we ended up singing uh, Sweet Home Chicago for I think at least till three o'clock night time whilst drinking whiskey. And the morning after, of course, at seven, we had our first meeting, but what a wonderful experience. I loved it. And I love Chicago. You know, I'm a Chicago Bears fan. I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. Uh, I have all the t-shirt and sweaters and um, I love Chicago. I mean, I, I could live there. Do you have a Sammy Sosa sweater? Like Sammy Sosa, like, you know, like the, you don't have a Sammy Sosa. Sweater. No, I don't have it. Uh, and it's over. Yeah, I don't know. Michael Jordan, do you wear Air Jordans when you go yeah, out? Yeah, of course. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's interesting. Like Chicago, well, you mentioned medieval history. Chicago has an incredibly rich art history. Georgia O'Keeffe, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, you know, when you go along, what do they call it? The Golden Mile is the merchant, the mercantile. But what's the area, the beautiful area along the, the river or the lake, whatever it is? It's lake. The lake. What's yeah, the... It's still at the end of the Golden Mile, you know, where yeah. the river enters. It's really the end of the Golden Mile. I don't remember exactly the name of the bridge, but, but it's the end of the Golden Mile. Yeah. Outrageous. And you would go back there and live. You would live Actually, there. That exactly where we did our consensus. It was at the Chicago Booth uh, Academy that is really in that specific point. Do, do you know how cold it is in Chicago? Yeah, oh my God, it was very cold. I went there in November, December, February. So I, yeah, it is very I, cold. I don't think I've never, been, I've never been during the summer. I wish I would go and enjoy the lake. I, eventually I'll do that for sure. Yeah, it's actually very pretty. I, I go because I like the art galleries and the museums and, and the architecture, you know, what's it called? Falling rock and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. quite magnificent. There, there's something that we were talking about before. Your sense of humor is not Italian. You know, Reedy, Pagliacci, and all that kind of stuff. That's not you. Okay. That's not you. It's um, it's it's British wit. You know, it's not, it's yeah. not quite the, it's not quite the goons or Monty Python, but it is still that sort of dry. Um, you have to like intelligent humor. Like British humor, you have to think about, like, because it's all wordplay and things like that. So you've continued that sort of approach to your life? Well, I, I hope so. <clears throat> I don't know if I can. Of course, there will be some utterly uh, 
pompous to say on my behalf, but but I have to say that uh, I I value a lot uh, British sarcasm, and because when when you are sarcastic with somebody, actually you are you are making a compliment because you are assuming that oh, the other right. person, yeah, you assume that the other person is te- intelligent enough to get it. Ah, I love it. Feedback. So uh, <clears throat> sometimes I, you need to adapt your sense of humor to the person you're talking to um, because you need to make sure that the person understands you. So actually, uh, I, I love wit. I love sarcasm because it's based on, the, on one concept. I value so much your intelligence that I'm sure that I can say something in which we can both laugh uh, afterwards. You're my brother. I love you. You're my friend. It's so cool. So, but what's interesting, that's, I, 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 that's communication. Can we stay on that for a second? That's communication. Because to me, when you are, it's not cruel sarcasm. You know, it's affectionate sarcasm. There, there's a big difference. I mean, I, I know that you're not supposed to tease people in North America. But does that that may not play in different parts of the world because you know I, I don't think I will want to be sarcastic in Japan because they would probably take a samurai sword and cut your head off, right? But but it's interesting. That's that's intriguing. And and you said it so beautifully. It's not really sarcasm, it's wit. And on some levels it's teasing, but it's wordplay in essence. It's wordplay. And that's British. That's so cool. In fact, the best is if you ever find yourself among two very clever ones, they kind of battling themselves. Absolutely. That is, uh, that is like top level. I enjoy it so much. As do I. That's so. That's well. We have to get together when all this craziness is over. I would love. And I'm coming to London as soon as real life starts again. Yeah. You know, we should meet in London for dinner. I'll take you out to lovely places. The okay. town is my town. So the other thing before we actually talk boring dentistry, like, you know, I don't want to go back to dentistry anymore. This is kind of too fun. We should be talking about buddy guy or something like that. That would be kind of cool. Um, women, and I don't mean this facetiously. No, no, no. I'm not asking you. You you have a beautiful wife, a couple of beautiful daughters. I mean, you know, you're a very fortunate man. You live with art historian. You live with beauty. But you've, you've talked about this, these beautiful ladies. I, you know, I, is in North America, if I talked about women in a very, you know, with the Me Too generation and all this kind of stuff, you know, you get slapped, you know, like you're being rude, you're being crude. But the Italians, it's not like that. No, it is not like that, which is a problem nowadays, because, of course, for us, it's, it's natural to uh, have some kind of a gentlemanship, if I may say. Yeah, that. absolutely. And it's perceived by being within your social rules. So if, if if I walk with, with a woman, I would open the door or I would pour wines. Mm-hmm. And I remember myself finding doing the same, for example, with friends over the States, which are a bit uncomfortable. With. Even the fact that Absolutely. if I go out with a woman, I should pay dinner. For me, it's the base. Even if it's a friend, if she's a friend, I would pay. And, and this is something that is not perceived as much as complimentous as Yes, right. actually, it is started, but but I cannot beat it. I mean, I I honestly love women. I cannot. In fact, I don't like men too much. I find men. <laughs> we are brothers, man. We are so oh, my brothers. I love I find them. them. So I find men so little interesting to me. You know, whereas women, they're so rich and so round that I could spend my evening talking with a woman. A man needs to be extremely clever or extremely oh, to capture my attention after a while. That, I don't want to sound horrible, but that's... You, you don't. You, you know, it, it's interesting because um, I don't even know why we're going here, but this is so cool. I mean, you know, but it's interesting, consistent themes. You're sartorially resplendent, as they might say. I don't know if that translates. Um, you know, you, you have your own brand, your own style, and you focus on people that are far more uh, aesthetic driven, uh, who speak probably, I think, more eloquently than men. Um, early on in these interviews, they started talking to me, these incredible people, um, uh, Henriette Lerner, um, uh, Catalin Nage. I mean, these incredibly sophisticated and intelligent women who are beautiful. 
and it was just, it was different. You know, uh, Snezhna Paul, last week, we did a fancy party. We had a party. Lovely woman. Lovely yeah. woman. I met her in in Croatia. A lovely, lovely woman. Very and there were so many others. It was just, I, I don't know, it was different. You know, I, I'm telling you, okay, this conversation has to stop. We're both going to get that. serious. But, but hey, don't you think, Ken, that aesthetics in, in the wider term, not just about the way you show, but the way you choose to live life, it's just mirroring what's happening inside you. Yes. So in a way, when, when I found what you <clears throat> might define as sophisticated woman, to me, once again, the way you show is the way you, you spread your voice. So it, it's a tool to say, look, I'm that type of complexity and I carry this richness with me and I'm giving this rich, richness to the entire world. Will you be able to stand and accept it or not? That's the challenge, you know? Sophisticated women are hardcore. I know I've been surrounded in my life, you know. Um, my mother is an extremely sophisticated woman. And so I, I know exactly what it means. But, uh, but, you know, like everything that is challenging, always worth the reward. The reward, the reward. So, yeah. Well, you challenge yourself, Fire. I really hate to do this. I'm just not comfortable with it. But we do have to talk dentistry. I mean, how can we not think? Oh, of course, yeah. You know, I mean, what, I forgot we're dentist. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Not, not an issue. No. So you mentioned, I'm curious. Um, Eastman is such a prominent uh, force in education. And, and, you know, so is Eastman in Rochester, New York. But what Eastman was, I take it, was how, how did this form? Is this. Eastman is Basically, George Eastman um, financed seven dental hospitals throughout all world. In fact, really? we, have, we have an Eastman in London, in Rome as well. Yes. Uh, I think only three are left, Rome, Rochester is in London, but mm -hmm. I might be mistaken. They're not connected among them. They're not. So, no, they're not connected. Basically, they were just funded by him. And I think the reason is that, if I remember well, that he had kind of like big teeth problem or dental problem or the family that had dental problem. So when he got reach he decided to found this hospital uh, so the eastman in london uh, which unfortunately have just recently left the historical headquarters okay. a victorian building beautiful building to be moved to a actually a much more modern building within the ucl area which is the bloomsbury area i used to live yeah. in bloomsbury. yeah i'm a bloomsbury gentleman <clears throat> to speak so the um but the, the East Eastman was really a, a pure, high-class, specialized dentistry hospital. Basically, it was just made of different units, and it was a, a, a third-level hospital. So you would get there only when the dentist would refer the patient. The patient could not just walk in and say, look, I want to be treated here. Right. You need to be referred to get there. And of course, then the patient would be allocated to one department or another. And I was so lucky to to work not just with Maurizio Tonetti, but to work with Lars Laurel, who has been really my true mentor, the person that shaped my professional approach to periodontology, which is crucial because he really taught me, I think the most important uh, knowledge that you can have, periodontology is the most easy and understandable discipline in dentistry. The problem that we have in dentistry Ken, can you hear me? Because you kind of actually, I can. The, the 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 feed is getting a little where your 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 video is frozen, but the audio is working. Um, do you want to come on back in and see if we can pick up the thread again? Oh, we froze again. Okay, so you're gonna have to re. Okay. And there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. No worries. Basically, I don't know where you left me, but I was talking about Lars Laurel. I don't know if yes. I Lars taught me that perio, periodontology, is the easiest discipline in dentistry. It's actually the most easy, the most logical, the simplest aspect of dentistry. Okay. The main problem that we have is that we have not been prepared for periodontology. I mean, we dentists, we are fixers. We solve problems. So we've been taught how to solve acute things. You have pain, I remove pain. You have a caries, I take it out. You have a wisdom tooth, I'm going to pull it over. You have a cyst, I'm going to take it out. So we basically cure people. You know, you come with a problem and you get out without the problem. So I solve lots of problems during the day. In the evening, I go out and I drink a beer with my friends and I did my job. That's really what dentistry is all about. 
I don't want to be dismissive of dentistry, but really the majority of dentistry is to solving problems. Now in perio, what you do, you actually instead treat a disease that is uncurable. So you move from treating an acute problem to treating something chronic. Now the chronic care model doesn't belong to us. Nobody has taught us to think as a diabetologist or right. uh, somebody else. So in fact, it's a tremendous battle. It's a trench war against a disease that will never, never stop coming back. And that's what you do. You set yourself for a journey that will last the patient's life in trying to keep their own teeth. So the main problem in perio is that we don't have the mentality to do perio. That's the first thing. You don't just cure with your hands. You need to make sure that you create a system. That's why, for example, I met very talented periodontists or maybe talented colleagues that can do amazing perisurgery, mm -hmm. but they're not capable to develop a periodontology unit within their own practice. Because doing perio is about changing the organization of the practice more than using the hands. And I'm going to say something that I'm going to be hated by a majority of periodontists. Periodontology is not difficult. Cardio surgery is difficult. Dentistry is easy. It's very fine and precise. You need to be focused all the time, but it's not difficult. Opening a, a heart and making a different, a change in the valve, that is difficult, but right. not bad. So the, the thing that you do, you can learn it. Even the most difficult, complex things, it takes some years, but you learn it. But what you need to understand is the way you build your practice, from the way the patient is received, the secretarial office, hygienist, organization, communication. Perio is a system of delivering dentistry. So what Lars Arell taught me is that perio is just applying biology with your hands. So when you know biology and you use your hands, you can change things. So it's not just about learning a protocol that even and let me be arrogant, even a monkey would learn, but he's continuously in challenge. You're in such trouble right now, my friend. You, you got a contract on your life, I guarantee. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No worries. <clears throat> but really, it's about changing. I mean, so whenever I do, I, I'm doing a surgery, I need to understand with some biological concept how to cut, how to cut the papilla, which material to use. But it's not that I have, a, a, let's say, a secret recipe. Mm -hmm. Every time I readapt. So the most important thing that a mentor should do is to teach how to think instead of teaching how to do things. And, and Lars Sarel did it with me very much. And I actually had a quick exchange of email very recently. And he's one of the person that changed my life. I'm Once again, I know all the people that changed my life. And Lars Sarel was duly one of, him, of his own. And, and there are others. We're going to talk about Perio Campus in a minute, but... Um, you know, you've written a ton of articles, many of which I read. Uh, I want to talk about them because, again, it, they're so varied. Pharmacology, bisphosphonate-related osteonecrosis of jaws. Um, but there is also categorization, which is interesting because I, I don't want to say any monkey, can, well, any monkey can do endodontics. That's a given, right? You know, you just give him a file and he just has to do it. It's easy, right? But it's what you're doing in all of these papers is you're creating categorization. So diagnosis, that's a very big part of what you seem to be doing. These, um, the consensus conference, uh, the way you look at papers, number of meta-analysis, that sort of thing. So that, like the technical part is technical. It is what it is, right? But the ability to diagnose, which seems to be where we're heading because of artificial intelligence and this sort of thing. Um, is that your focus? Is that what you're trying to do with the Herald and Perio Campus and all of these other things? Is that what you see as being the issue? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, <clears throat> what, what we try to do with, uh, with, with the campus and, and also uh, with the work I'm doing is to make things clear and straight. Once again, the concept is that Perio is easy. Perio is very easy. The problem is to pass the knowledge of how easy and how to adapt your mind. Um, so diagnosis is the base. Uh, uh, in fact, it doesn't concern me what the periodontist is doing. The problem is that the majority of my colleagues would diagnose perio only when it's advanced or severe. Right. Using mild and, and the incipient cases that of course, if any of us can, would have to have a disease, we would both like to get 
diagnose at the early stages, isn't it? Because that's when, when it's easier to treat. So the new classification will allow to do that. That's why we made all these exercises, all this calibration to do screening and to do in diagnosis in the right way. Uh, but, but I think that the majority of my research is going in two directions. One is the impact of the disease on the oral and systemic health and quality of life. And the other aspect is periodontal surgery. There are so many misconceptions about periodontal surgery and my, myself and, and my team, well, I don't like to say my team, myself and these nice colleagues of mine that have been growing with me in the last years, we try to put the base of modern periodontal surgery by one simple understanding that when you do a periodontal surgery, we still rely on literature that was doing a surgery, what I call the quarter of pizza surgery. What? Because it's, yeah, the quarter of pizza surgery, because the majority of the classical study studies on periodontal surgeries are based on an area between the 70s and the 80s, where they really, the, the father of modern periodontology made this kind of studies where they put a patient with perio, and for each quarter of the dentition, they would have tried the different techniques. Right. So they're comparing within the same patient different techniques and putting all together the data. There are so many flaws in this kind of study design, but there's nothing wrong with that. We're talking about studies of 30, 40 years ago, but I'm not going into that detail. I think what is important that when you're doing a quadrant surgery or a sextant surgery, you're actually merging areas with different potentiality of healing, forcation, horizontal defects, vertical defects, all together. And then you kind of making an overall mean so what we tried to do in the last 10 years was to highlight the efficacy, the performance of surgery according to each type of defect, not just in trabony because the vertical defect, we know so much, but the vertical defects are just the 10, 15% of the defects. What I care the most are horizontal, craters, forcation, defects down to the apex. These are the defects where actually we like lots of knowledge. For example, I'm so glad I have the recipient of a very important grant from osteology to actually we run a multi-center studies on regeneration of craters. Because still today we treat craters by removing the palatal bone, by creating a ramp. And I cannot possibly understand that in 2020, we treat a chronic disease by amputation. You know, you have a chronic disease and you remove tissue. No, no, it doesn't work with me. To me, it's a loser approach. You have a chronic disease, you need to build tissues back but we have little knowledge. So we really started to say, we have a quite a significant number of papers to try to understand that when you're doing a quadrant surgery, you're expecting a different type of healing according to a site-specific analysis. So you adjust the flap and the papilla management and the usage of material for each type of papilla. That is what I think is reasoning, the way you reason surgery. And in fact, it gives even a better outcome. So it's interesting. I was just, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't came to look away, but I'm trying to read all these notes. Like, you know, I, I killed the tree to do this. Um, uh, okay. Hold on. Now. I just got lost. So the way you've structured your programming is anatomy, epidemiology, etiology and pathogenesis and susceptibility. I don't see anything here that talks about cutting gums, right? So again, that is, I think, you're, you're, what you're doing now, you're checking the Pro Campus Foundation. Yes. The yes. Campus is based on different models. You have foundation, you have surgical. Okay. Surgery. Okay. So, uh, because you see, <clears throat> if I would have to, to tell you what PERIO is all about, I think you, you can summarize PERIO in really few points that I actually I did it. I, I, yes, gonna, show me notes. No, I'm, I'm going to post it actually, this one on Instagram shortly because. I think it's important, but really perio has some specific point. It's about human beings. It's about, it's about an exchange about human beings. Then it's about changing habits and behavior. And you need to learn the theory between habits. Otherwise you're not gonna do it. Then it's about instrumenting successfully. And then it's about doing surgery. And when it's about doing surgery to me nowadays in 2020, when surgery is needed, regeneration is needed. To me, I regen now, you know, if I compare myself in 2005, when I moved back to Italy, right. I was doing a thousand surgery per year. Now I don't go above 200, but 
Yeah, I, I do less and less surgery, but I do surgery that is more complicated. Of the 200, they're all regenerated surgery. They're all very complex surgery down to the apex or opalist teeth and so forth. Whereas in those 1000, there are plenty of what I call touristic surgery. When you do surgery to explore, when you do surgery to clean better, and maybe even to compensate an unsuccessful non-surgical treatment. In fact, a very good non-surgical treatment should allow you to treat the 70% of the patient. What? Yeah. Uh, the, nowadays, it's very clear. In fact, we have published this on the latest uh, European Federation of Periodontology guidelines. Right. Right. 75% of the pockets will be closed by non-surgical treatment. Uh, but remember that the remaining 25 would need surgery and you need to be done good in doing surgery. Okay, so take me for a walk through this. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to come to grip. This is, you You did a lot, of, some of your work was on uh, regenerative, well, not some, your, your work is on regenerative but growth factors. Yeah. So, so how do you attack a non-surgical problem in terms well, of protocols? Well, basically, I think non-surgery is the base. Each patient will get non-surgical for a okay. different number of reasons. First of all, it's efficacious. Secondly, it's cheap, not just for the patient, but for us as a dentist. And, and then it, if you need to go for the surgery, it would prepare the patient and the tissue for the surgery. So non-surgical treatment is the base. What you do, you do your non-surgical treatment, you wait the tissue to heal, that has to be two to three months, because if you evaluate after one month, you haven't given the time yet the tissue to heal. Right. I'll give an example. A gum is made, of course, as every mucosa by an epithelium and a connective tissue. Right. Now, the epithelium will most probably heal within three weeks because epithelium is dramatically clever and fast tissue. It's very fast, so it will heal straight away. But the connective tissue, especially the way the gum is structured, is very peculiar. I always make this example, and I don't like to... <laughs> I'm kind of getting old. I'm doing the same jokes all the time. I need to do something. But anyway, a gum, if you, you, need, look, you need a you need a writer, you have to get somebody to come in and write for you. Comedy writer. A gum, if you if you look at that from an histological standpoint, you would see all the collagen packed one to another. And it does look like a lasagna. You know what lasagna is, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a lasagna of collagen, you know, straight and layers on layer of collagen. That maturation of collagen takes weeks. You don't do it in three weeks. It takes at least six weeks, eight weeks. That's why if you probe after one month that you've done your non-surgical instrument, instrumentation, you'll find lots of pocket, but not because your treatment wasn't successful, just because you haven't given the time yet to the tissue to heal. Right. So what happening is that you are all underestimating your healing capabilities by reassessing the patients too early. That's why you need to wait two to three months. And then you make your examination and you decide whether to go for surgery or not. That is the moment where I see the periodontist. Understanding when to do surgery or when to do a second session on non-surgical treatment, then it's when you're a good one. You need to be a really good one to understand the indication for surgery. And I have to say, that is the point where perio is lacking lots of knowledge. We have very little literature on this on non-surgical reinstrumentation versus surgical treatment. Interesting. So you see, treating a patient is a flow of different steps. It's not that you choose somebody from the beginning and say go for surgery or not. Actually, I don't like the loser approach never in life. So I never like when somebody's saying I'm doing this as an initial treatment. We don't do initial treatment. We do treatment and we aim at the best. If that doesn't work, then I would think about surgery. But I never start by thinking, well, that's too deep. We'll for sure we'll go for surgery. That's a loser approach. I don't like it. So it's interesting that you mentioned that. When I was in graduate school the, at Forsyth, the ortho department was down the hall. And so even in those days, it sort of, well, it was beginning. But over the course of time, as I got to know more and more people, I guess I could relate this to Maurice Salama pulling down a tooth and causing alveolar regeneration. Um, one of the prosthodontists I worked with did perioprost at UPenn. So initially I got very interested in orthodontics just because, well, actually there was a very good looking person in training down the hall. Um, but the uh, stuff that I've seen, um, you know, if I do the endo and even if the tooth is like a mess, they'll still bring the tooth down, facilitate regeneration of the alveolus. 
this sort of thing. And I'm, I'm looking at, well, we'll talk about Perio. Well, no, we're going to talk about it now. Let me share my screen because this is so cool. The Perio Campus Herald. So you are like the editor. You're like the William Randolph Hearst of periodontology, right? So, the, well, let me blow this up so it's easier to see. There we go. And we'll get you over here. So, um, again, this is you. You are the voice of the periodontics, right? Yeah. So you were pointing out even the font. Like, this is... Yeah, I, I love that font. And I, I've been searching for that font for, I think, a month. But I had a very specific idea. It was kind of a 50s American style, you know, kind yeah. of a... Maybe I would say American Art Deco, which was a bit maybe later than the classical Art Deco. And... and and, and I, it took me a while, but I'm very happy. I, I actually tell myself it's a very Chicago style. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? And it's kind of a uh, Chicago style. Yeah. And no, Pericampus Herald was, it's basically made on the idea that we don't, I mean, we of course talk very highly scientifical among us, and we, we exchange knowledge in terms of, uh, information in terms of um, treatment and techniques, but we don't talk about our difficulties. We don't talk about our vision, our thought, our opinions, uh, which is good because of course, we, opinions don't really have that tremendous values in science, but still we are a community. So I wanted to do, I wanted to create a journal for made by periodontists for the periodontists, for the dentist that would actually show even our human aspect our dilemma, our problems, and our vision, our opinions. So each one of these columns, of course, you can click it and you go to the main articles where there are, of course, clinical cases, uh, but, but there is also literature, but it's also lots of opinions, lots of human, human beings getting out, lots of personas. Uh, so there are some that are very surgical ones, others that are more about you know, changing the patient or dealing with topic on etiopathogenesis, but we try to cover every aspect of perio and implants. And I have to say, one of the columns is called Perio for Thought, and we host each issue some very well-renowned periodontists or implantologists worldwide to talk about something. For example, this issue that you just showed, yeah. we had Martina Stefanini on top, that she's a brilliant... Oh, sorry, let me go back. Yeah, a brilliant uh, uh, young uh, periodontist. Uh, and she's very famous. She's worked with uh, Giovanni Zucchelli for many years, and she's a very famous plastic surgeon, extremely talented one. And and in fact, you see, she talked about the beauty in periodontal plastic surgery. So yeah. she's focused yeah. on the concept of beauty. And of course, she's showing a Corona Advanced Flap. And in the same issue, we also have Mario Romandini, who is a, a very nice uh, uh, postgraduate student who is studying in Madrid with Mariano Sanz and David Herrera, showing instead the tunnel approach. So we try to focus the issue on, on beauty and effectiveness on, on plastic surgery on this. This is the third issue of the hair. This is well, so great. Beautifully the done. One that, the one that you can see on my back, I don't know if you can see it. No, you're, you're on screen. Yeah, yeah, I've got the, the one behind you, yeah. which is not the same one, of course. The something hopeless, that's the only thing I can read. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Can, can you unshare the screen so I'll show you? Absolutely. Let me unshare the screen. Uh, yeah, but, but you see. Oh, how hopeless. Can, how hopeless. Can... Yeah, <laughs> to me, that was crucial. I mean, that was an article that I wrote by showing one case of an hopeless tooth that was sent to me for extraction eight years ago, but the tooth is still there. And, and I've tried to collect lots of cases that were sent and given the diagnosis of hopeless but they're still there because dentistry is capable to change the prognosis, even when teeth are extremely complex. You know, we go to an endodontist uh, congress and we see people saving teeth that you would say, oh my God, I should take it out. You go to perio and it's exactly the same. So why this scaring is important? It's important because I really, if I would have to sum up my vision as a dentist, it's very simple. I think that everybody, has the right to smile with their own teeth throughout all their life. Dentistry, now it's so elegant and so well-shaped 
that you, we could say the majority of the teeth, I really don't see the point now to face a patient with extraction. We should try to remove extraction from our syllabus and try always to get for maybe the most complex treatment, but trying to save in teeth. I think that's the, the remit for sure. As a periodontist, my goal is to keep teeth in the dentition. And you see here, we have this, and the percampus cells with was me doing on all place. Then we have Larissa Muzic, who is a brilliant researcher from uh, Zagreb University. She's the woman of alitosis now. She's done the PhD on alitosis and she's working on alitosis. And then here we have the greatest Cristiano Tommasi. Yeah. Cristiano Tommasi, that is, of course, in the Gothenburg University and is working, as majority of the people know, on, on periodontal research and especially per implantitis research. And what he's doing in each issue of the Herald is to keep one classical paper and explain why that paper is so important for our clinical practice. So I'm sorry if I'm now getting enthused, but you know, oh, the, no. Herald, this is the Herald is really made to help people understand why perio is so great. But, but listening, the human aspect of it, the opinions, the way we, we get literature, change it, shape it in our mind, and then doing things with our hands to our patients. How beautiful is that, isn't it? Well, okay, so the other, well, first of all, let's establish the reality. You're a Renaissance man, like without question. Like you still are, you're still infused, inculcated uh, with art history. Because even the way you're describing this, it's art history. Your humor shows through. Let me just go back here because I thought this, just the, the way you phrased it. Uh, share my screen, where'd you go? Share my screen and there we go. So you can see this, we're back on you, right? Yeah. You can, okay, so here, here's what caught my attention with all this. Okay, so what's Sol Invictus mean? The sun, what's this? Uh, basically it's a Latin sentence and it means the sun will, uh, will never be won. So the sun will always win. Uh, uh, and uh, will always survive. And, and that was uh, my editorial that is based mainly on this horrible 2020. You know, it's been really the most complex year of my life and I think of many other people's life. Mm -hmm. for, for a person that is bound to communicate, to be within people, can you imagine what does it mean to me not traveling, not being in the community, just being locked down? I mean, I, it's, it, it really killed me and it changed really my life for, for many aspects. But, but I also want to say that as much as you can see cloud, it's like really flying, you know? When, when you go through the thickness of cloud, it takes a while, but then you always find the sun afterwards. So they can really torture us, but you can't beat the sun. The sun will always resuscitate and the sun cannot be defeated. Be so uh, I think that what is important is to grip uh, sorry, to grasp the things that are important. And, and I think what is important now is the love that we have around us, you know, the people that love us, you know, our community, our life, that is really the base for, uh, for our future. And, and trust me, every day I wake up excited because I know that it will be better. And, and I see the future will be amazing. Can you believe it, Ken, when we will be over the pandemic? Yeah, it's going to be, yeah. How many kids nine months afterwards you'll see? Yeah, you're going to have like, how many new enterprises, how many new projects? People right. is just incubating now, but you will see it. I mean, I'm just looking forward to that day. I mean, I'm kind of- it, it, There have been, even during the pandemic, there's obviously been an awesome amount of innovation because people had the time to innovate. It wasn't like they were running. Um, this is, okay, so here's what I'm seeing in this. I mean, other than the formatting of the Perio Herald, I mean, I, I love words. The sun can be obnubilated. Like, what the hell did, what, what is obnubilated? It's, in, it's, where is it? It's right here. The sun can, unless it's a spelling mistake, the sun can be obnubilated. What obnubilated means that it's a very posh and archaic term to describe that uh, uh, something that is obnubilated is when you have lots of clouds. In fact, it's based in, for example, in uh, uh, Nebula, in, in Latin, is cloud. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I'm reading, like, even the way you write is outrageous. I think this is amazing. And there's always, again, there's, it's not sarcastic. I mean, it's sort of like a sardonic wit, you know, it's, it's. But, but also a very beautiful, intelligent copywriter, most probably. That is. Also... I, it, it, I get, oh, yes, oh, sorry, you have a beautiful and intelligent copywriter. Or you are a beautiful and intelligent copywriter. No, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not that arrogant, but, uh, uh, but yeah, of course, you know, we, 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 we had to go all the time. Bear in mind that uh, everybody writes the majority of the article directly in English. Right. But of course, then we, we, we check them among ourselves. We don't have a professional copywriter. It's all the editorial team that we check one to the others. So whenever it happens, as you know, when you put lots of brilliant minds together, you know, things triggers and develop even more. So, yeah. This, this thing towards gender equality. So you're picking up on what is, I hope, will be a new trend. Uh, not that it's new, but there will be an increasing trend towards gender equality in implantology. And I think if I understand this correctly. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not, into, I'm not into gender equality. I'm actually quite inequal because I like, as you know, me, women more than men. So even in the numbers of the editorial, there are more women. But what I think is important is that for example, the WIN project is a project that is trying to give a podium to female implantologists. Okay. And there are lots of nice movements in, in, in the present, at the present, that are really highlighting the importance of, we have tremendous uh, colleagues. I mean, I'm not into gender things because I never really cared about genders. I just care about intelligence. If somebody is intelligent, I uh, has all my respect in respect of the gender. But, but I think we need to support these initiatives nowadays. I, I agree. Uh, raising the conversation is crucial in terms of what we are doing. So wait a minute, I got to go back because there's so much more. I, this is going to go on indefinitely. I have to find out where I just went. Uh, nope, wrong place. Let me go back. You'd think I would have learned by now <laughs> to do this. Uh, hold on. Where did I go? Uh, come on back. Come on back. Uh, no, I lost it. Where did I go? I'll figure it out. Bear with me for a moment. Oh, no worries. I mean, I can. As I mean, we, it's it's just, so cool. uh, what did I do? What did I do here? Uh, okay. So I'll look it up. That's easy. I mean, I remember what it was. So I'm going to look it up. So we are, oh, wait, maybe did I leave it over here. Anyway, hang on for a sec. Bear with me. Um, okay, I know what I wanted to see. More Periocampus. Periocampus, that's the Herald, Periocampus International. This was what caught my attention. So again, you are, tell me about Periocampus. That's what I wanted to talk about as well. Periocampus, it's, it's like Croatia, Italy, you're going international with it? I mean, we have, well, well. Pericampus was founded like eight years ago in Italy, and okay. we had more than 700 colleagues that did the campus uh, and throughout the years. And, and it's based on one concept, is that it, it, was, it started with me and Cristiano Tommasi, because myself, Cristiano studied in Gothenburg before, and he had Lars Larel as a mentor, and I studied in London, and I had Lars Larel. So what happened that we were more than 10 years discussing clinical cases at the Italian Society of Perio. And myself and Cristiano always had in mind the same treatment plan. So we both realized that the person who shaped our clinical vision really gave us this approach. And, and this is incredible. <clears throat> so we thought that we should have uh, basically support and help people in finding their approach to the clinic. And that's why we founded the Perio Campus because it's not a period course, it's a campus. That's why people sleep in the same hotel, eat all together, breakfast, lunch, dinner, because we want to give them the same atmosphere that I had when I was in London or Christian <clears throat> had in Gothenburg. So basically it's about trying to be fully immersed within Perio and to try to uh, change the way we think uh, our clinics and give the base of Perio. So we, Perio campus is usually based on the foundation model and the advanced model, and then the results of the patient model directly on patients in my practice, uh, Perio patient. But we've launched even the Perio campus international. Uh, we'll, we add it in 
Ukraine, the next one is going to be in Zagreb in May, from the 20th to the 22nd in May, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful Zagreb. <clears throat> Croatia is going to be a blast, yeah. Because I know Shiznana just did an incredible program in Zagreb. Um, I just spoke to her last week about her new app, um, Decisions, Decision Matters, which is kind of interesting. Where, where, this yeah, is... I, haven't, I haven't seen the app yet. I know she was running the course, in fact, uh, I think yesterday. I mean, I think she just did her course in Zagreb. Yeah, over the weekend. You, you keep wanting me to join with the subscribe to our newsletter. Please join. Please subscribe. Please join. Please join. <clears throat> so, ah, here's the word. Here's the word. Empowering. Empowering. Evidence-based empowering. That's but what I wanted to see. That's the acronym of the course. The, 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 the course is Passione, which in Italian means passion. You know? P stands for patient-centered, personalized, A, applied biology, as skillful, as supporting the right decision, it's inspiring, it's based on ongoing evaluation, it's novel, it's an evidence-based, and empowering our subject. That's what makes the word Passione, which is really the base of my work. And Prairie Campus is all about passion, and the people that have been there found it realize it, that passion is, all, is everything in our profession. Everything you do is with passion. And uh, I'm, I'm actually glad to say, and I don't want to, to say that I'm to, uh, I'm just telling myself things, but it, it really is a course that is based on passion. Passion for, passion from the teachers, passion from the, the, the colleagues that are pay, part of it. And I'm really looking forward to being Zagreb in May. It's gonna be a fantastic, uh, fantastic event. All right, so your the plan is for May again with the no the, the Italian ones we we have one in February, one in March, and one in May. Whereas okay. the, the the international one is going to be May. Uh, yeah, twenty twenty two to twenty six. So the name Cristiano to my, well, listen, I'm an endodontist, so a lot of these names mean nothing. But um, well, Axelson and Lindy for Lindy for sure. Um, Cristiano Tomasi, you, we you you mentioned him a number of times. He, because yeah. you went to Gothenburg at, at one, well, first of all, I have to go through one thing. You collaborate in Spain, Germany, Greece, China, Croatia, London, UK, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, and obviously in Italy. You, you obviously, are these all multi-center tests that you're doing? Is this multi-center collaborations in terms of the research that you do? Oh, collaboration, sorry, with the departments of periodontology. So I keep asking the same thing. You obviously lecture, you travel around the world. These multi-center studies that you do, how do you create the uh, hypothesis and bring all these people on board? Obviously, you're working on the same concept. So how do you manage to do all this and still stay sane when you've got different time zones and people doing different things and this sort of stuff? How, how does this happen for you? Well, well, periodontists are, are peculiar people. <laughs> no discussion. Again, you're going to get shot. Like, <laughs> stop this. You're going to have like a, the Camorra are going to come up to Pisa, man. Just be very careful. Yeah, that's true. But, but, but you see, we, we're, we're actually even a small community. I mean, when it comes to, to, to the ones that are doing research, at the end, we are not talking about more of maybe 100 people worldwide. And so we keep bunching one to each other and we're all friends. Of course, some people we argue like every intellectuals, you know, we, we disagree, but you never disagree with the person or it's never personal. It's, it's maybe a different approaches. Uh, let me quote one of my greatest friends, which is Moshe Goldstein uh, from, in fact, we, from the same Leo Shapira's university in Jerusalem. Myself and Moshe, Moshe is one of my greatest friends. You know, we like to go out for dinner when I'm in Israel. We always go for a steak because we, we both love steaks. We are not vegetarian, I have to say we're exactly the opposite. You're a carnivore. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but yeah, very much so. But, but when it comes to talking about perio, most of the times we argue, but it's never personal. It's really a debate among people with different opinions. So that's what happened in our community. But we also share lots of ideas and, and, and I think we are moving to a stage where each one of us can run trials of 20, 40, 50 people, but no more than that. Because perio compared to, for example, my friends that are doing research on materials, dental materials, they do a research over a weekend. When I, if I have an idea with you today, most probably we'll see the paper in four or five years mm. because it's a long, long way to go. So the best way to do now is to join forces. 
because only by joining forces, by mul doing multi-center trials, you can really get to the nitty gritty, to the granularity of the, of the knowledge that you can't get with just 20 patients. Of course, multi-center trial have a very weak uh, internal validity because of course it's difficult to calibrate, right. but the external validity is huge. And now research is about answering clinical questions. Well, I want my research to be quoted, not by another scholar, but to be quoted by a dentist that needs to make a decision in front right. of a patient. That's when research is, is relevant. I'm just, I was looking at something here, 2013, the Earl Robinson Periodontal Regeneration Award. So was that like, is there also like a Scott Joplin and a Robert Johnson Regeneration? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's been one of my, the greatest moments of my life because of course it's a very important uh, research prize from the American Academy of Perio. It's made for papers on regeneration. That was very important because I remember that Bob Janko was there and he said that um, it was very pleasant. He said, uh, you can't understand the pleasure of seeing you walking down the stage to get the, the prize. And uh, it's been a glorious moment, glorious moment, yes. Very so I have a question here because I spoke to Lior last week and his he's probably accumulated in excess of a million dollars in grants. So you got one grant for 800 and something or other thousand euros. So I suggest that the two of you consider having the bank of periodontology to handle all of these grants. No, that, that was the uh, highest grant that I had. Of course, I had others, but, but that has been one of the best move of my professional life because when I moved back to Italy, and I moved back because it felt right, but it was a very strange decision because I had everything in London and I moved back to Pisa to be a, just a, an assistant lecturer with a very low salary in a town that, as you know, is the most beautiful town in Italy but it's not as big as New York, right? So right. In more, go, going from London to Pisa is kind of going to Rochester. You know, it's kind of very small thing. And, uh, I, and the thing is that I got my position, but I wasn't given any space in the surgical theater. They just gave me one dental chair, three afternoons. So we started myself and two students doing research there on, those, on that single chair in the afternoon, the three of us. And then we started to publish and publish till in 2012, I got a grant that was 1 million euro, was huge, was 900 and something. And it was a fantastic grant made by the Ministry of Health in, in Italy for young researchers to develop big project. And my project was called Periodontal Disease as an Emergent Systemic Pathology. Mm -hmm. And with that money, I bought three dental shares. I paid nine salaries for three years, even to diabetologists, cardiologists, and young periodontists. And we, we started this little unit of period that was built just for research. That's where all the publication came from. So that was the first time they never gave this, this grant to a dentist. And uh, I was very young and was very happy. And that was a great move in my career. But I have to say that uh, I kind of wasted it. Now I know. Yeah, because at that time, I was still a first violin. I wasn't a director of orchestra. Now it, it takes time to understand that is difficult to train your coworker to be a team. You need, you need maturity, you need time. You need to have gone through lots of shit, if I say so, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to, to, to understand yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how to, to say it you know, formally, but you really need to create a bit of life before understanding what leadership is about. And leadership is, is about sharing. I mean, and, but to, to share things, you need to give yourself and most important, you need to give your time. And I had no time then because my time was devoted to, to develop myself. So we did a lot, but if I would have that grant now, oh my God, I, yeah. I, I could create an empire because the, the mindset is different. I, well, again, you, you also got private funding, but not small stuff. You had like hundreds of thousands of euros from private groups. So yes. how did this come about? No, uh, now they contact me to do research, of course, I had to knock at the many doors. And, and of course you see the grants, but you don't see the grants that I have not received. So this is just the tip okay. of the iceberg. The majority of the ones that were turned down, they said, I'm sorry, we don't have the money. I'm sorry, we don't know you. I'm sorry, we don't like the idea. It's, it's part of the game, but it's like, you know, you, you keep pushing. Then eventually somebody will say yes. 
and but we need money i mean the university will not give us to in any possible system enough money to a scholar to develop clinical research you know each patient in a research would cost you thousands and thousands of euros the university of pisa most probably might pass me three to four thousand euros per year to do research mm. so which is really nothing you need to get money in to develop bigger projects which is you know part of the game you need to accept you are you're in a market as well you know you need to to expose yourself and of course visibility once again communication it's important as much otherwise people might why they should think oh but yeah that graziani guy is a very good researcher now of course First, scholars read papers, but once again, we are about 100 in the entire world. We are not that many. So mm -hmm. it, it's about spreading what you do. I mean, you know, we, we, we've been through that. I don't believe in talent. I think talent is a loser excuse. There is no talent. There is just application, dedication, and love and passion. That's it. Everybody can do everything if they really want. Put their minds to it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I think talent is, when I hear somebody says, oh, but he's so good in doing surgery because he has so much talent. I mean, I, I hate it. I mean, I've seen people with greatest talent in life wasting it completely. And I saw people that no talent becoming so great because they just wanted it. I think it's the drive and the purpose that makes the difference. But anyway, so. You're a fascinating gentleman. Oh, wait, wait. So, okay, I just want to, okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I hope they make sense. Um, okay, I'm going to back up because I, I want to know how this starts. When I did my, my master's, I did one peer-reviewed paper in my life. Everything else I wrote was fluff, you know, for companies, got to lecture, build your practice, all this kind of nonsense. Um, but, okay, so wait, I got to find a paper that really jumped out at me. Uh, okay, so you did a lot of, or, like, oral systemic concern pregnancy your most one of your most recent is on COVID transmission in the dental practice a brief okay. review of preventive this is april of 2020 okay and we wrote a book you know we we, we uh, yeah if people would connect on my instagram account here they can download book. the book for free on on covid and dentistry during the first uh, lockdown we 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 try to do our best so we started to work a lot on covid and we we published that papers on JDR, but we also, uh, on journal, journal Dental Research, but we also wrote a book that is free, it's online. You, you'll find on Instagram the link if you want to download it and yeah, listen sure. to it, that's very important. So a lot of what you've done, where, I just lost it, of course. A lot of what you've done relates to what you spoke about, frications, dehiscences, um, a lot of oral health, um, chlorhexidines, uh, pharmacology, bisphosphonate-related osteoarthritis. I went over that one. Where's the one? Oh, here it is. This is what I wanted to do. Periodontitis and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. As we've mentioned, that's a big interest of yours. Come on, Ken, what'd you do with it, man? Um, so a lot of them are clinical studies, but you did obvious basic research. Uh, so here's my question. I'm going on and on and on. Uh, okay. So I'm one of your... Oh, here's the one. Okay. Um... Uh, Cyclooxygenase 2, okay? A name. I pulled the name out. What? I'm, I made you nervous? No, I'm, I'm getting nervous. I'm not a bio lab guy. You know, I'm a clinical researcher. So don't be too harsh on me. Well, but you were the second author on this. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a student in your program. And I come to you. I've done some work. You know, my training is in periodontal surgical techniques because that's what I'm going to practice. But I come to you and I say, you know, professor, I have to do a research project. Okay. So you say, well, why don't you do it on cyclooxygenase too? Right. Just pull it out of the air. Right. Yeah. So explain to me how you get us, like for people who uh, want to do this or have looked into doing this or they're getting their master's or PhD. How do you get someone started doing a research paper? Well, uh, that one, I think what I would say, I think inflammation, inflammation is a key point. If I would have to go through basic science, now I would work on inflammation. You know, my good friend, I think he's also yours, Alp Kantarchi from, in fact, the Foresight uh, Institute. 
once told me, and I remember I, I was actually a very good moment because it was the moment that I got the, um, the EFP Research Prize. And, uh, that was uh, the Jacquard Prize in 2015. And my work was on modulating inflammation uh, by applying different type of, the, of periodontal protocols by, with the objective of reducing the risk of cardiovascular. And, and I remember that Alp came to me and said, Filippo, inflammation is a good thing. And he's absolutely right. Inflammation is a good thing. The problem comes when inflammation is not solved or is maybe too high. So the majority of the disease that we're facing today are just alteration of inflammation. So inflammation is really one of the base of all the aspects between the oral health and the systemic health. So if I would have somebody, I mean, my PhDs, in fact, they're all work in a way or another to inflammation. I have Urshamar from Slovenia. She works with me and she's working on obesity and mm -hmm. treatment. I have Marina Peric from uh, Croatia. She's also here in Pisa and she's working instead on the impact on quality of life and, and inflammation, systemic right. inflammation of changing uh, the habits of the patient. Stefano Genai did the PhD on inflammation and treatment. Dimitra Karapetsa from Athens on arthritis rheumatoides. Inflammation is the base. So I would, for a PhD, now I would focus very much on inflammation. Clinically, no, you change it clinically, but the base is the knowledge of inflammation. So uh, you've got a number that, well, this is interesting. The one on periodontitis and systemic diseases, which show up a lot, but this is on obesity and diabetes. So very relevant in the COVID era right now. The comorbidities are very relevant. Are you structured? You've got one, two, three, four, five papers that have not been published yet, but they're being prepared. Uh, access flap, where was the other one? Implants, uh, strategies, okay? Di you know, consideration diagnostically and strategies. So again, like, so I'm, Ken Sirota comes to Pisa and he says, uh, you know, Filippo, I want to get my blah, 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 and help me get started. So I have a topic in mind. So how do you set up the lab? How do you start getting him to design the, uh, design the, the format of this, the, you know, design the investigation? Then I've got to, you know, look at my results, statistics, etc. I understand the logic of the protocol. How do you as an advisor support me? I support you in everything, but the part in lab because once again, I'm a clinical researcher. So we build up the research design together because I'm a trialist. So I do clinical trial. That's okay, way. okay. Uh, how to do the protocol. We submit the protocol, we get our approval. Then you work in my unit, you can use patients and do the treatment yourself, collect samples, send them to a lab where most probably a PhD peer of, your, of yourself, maybe a biologist will most probably work and will teach you how to do things. And then we will analyze the data and, and he, I will teach you to do the statistics as well. Of course, if you, if you need, I mean, when you do clinical research, you, you have to do the statistics yourself, otherwise you don't know how to design the study. Right, right. But, but statistics, it's easy. Once again, these are the classic very things simple. that you don't very understand. Very simple. No, uh, it's the kind of things that when we have a sort of a, uh, let's say, kind of, we're fearing, we are worshiping them, like what the hell? But once you get into that, it's very easy. I would suggest, uh, well, I can suggest plenty of books, but one that is really good is statistics for people that they think they hate statistics. It's a great, <laughs> really it teaches you how to do the, the majority of things that are needed. And plus we have YouTube nowadays. You know, when I, know some, I don't know something, I just check on YouTube some tutorials and then I can do it. Outrageous, outrageous. Okay, so, I mean, I've kept you an hour and a half. That's a lot of time. So, like, I want to finish it up on a very personal basis. So, what car do you drive? What kind of car do you drive? I drive a 1989 Carrera Ford Porsche, red. I was going to say Porsche because I saw it in the pictures. I did not know what year. So, but it was an old Porsche. It's an old Porsche. An old Porsche. An old Porsche. An old Porsche. And so, once again, the Renaissance I like the one. You don't like the new ones? No, they're too refined. I like, the, I like the noise that when I drive, you feel that you're driving a car, not a, a coffee machine. So, um, you, I mean, when I'm driving, you, you hear me coming from 200 meters because it's a very rough uh, engine, but very pleasant, very pleasant.
So there's an interesting thought. I never had it. What if you put a DeLonghi espresso machine in your car? So you can literally drink espresso while you're driving. That would be very different. Um, so I would have I, I would have assumed to test the Rosa because you were in Turin a lot, but that's okay. But regardless, um, I don't have that money. <laughs> what millions of see if, if you have to do it right, all that grant money, you should have allocated some of it for all the suits that you would buy because you were going to lecture on it. You have to think of these things. No, but I'll never make money. I'm not the guy that makes money. I don't care about money. So I will never make money, but uh, it's okay. I, I will survive. I'm sure you will. So I, I do have a question, sort of the last question in all of this. Um, you're 46 and you know the body of your work is staggering. You know, the, the European Federation of Periodontology. So you've climbed the ladder in terms of organizational uh, levels, you know, president, etc. You're a research, uh, you have your own research group, you lecture extensively, uh, you speak a little bit in Italian. Have you lost your Italian, by the way? No, I speak very Toscan, actually. But You're very Toscan. Toscan, okay, very good. So tell me what, if I met you in five years, well, four years, you're going to turn 50, and that's a very traumatic time because you realize that you're halfway to going this way with your red sock. Yes. So what are you going to be doing? Well, it, it is likely that you're going to meet me and uh, I'm not, I might not be a dentist anymore. Really? Yeah, we, 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 we might meet in a bar and talk about other things. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I will not be a dentist. I'm saying that I'm not excluding not to be a dentist within my next three, four years. So I, mean, I, I personally never thought that I would have done this life all my, all my, all my life. Yeah. No. So are you going to transition into digital technologies, communication? I, I, I don't know exactly where I'm transitioning, but I know that I'm transitioning. I, I, <laughs> I know that I'm passing through dentistry. And, and dentistry gave me so much, but it's really one of the tools that helped me to express my voice. So uh, I know for sure that you will find a person that uh, with lots of drive, lots of passion, and they always feel that we'll always feel that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday, because that's my, my attitude and I cannot change it. Then most probably will feel what I'm feeling today that I've just started. You know, you were saying the FP things sounds nice, but I really feel that I just started. I'm, I'm not saying this as a the sort of a commonplace. And my feeling that I've just started doing things. I'm just at the beginning. I'm, I'm, I'm a kid. So I think that the attitude will be the same. What I'm not sure is that I will be still in Pisa. I don't know if I'll still be a dentist. I don't know. Um, it's likely that I will not. I don't know. Roots and wings. Unbelievable. Roots and wings. Um, this was, uh, well, I, I mean, I had no idea the sheer scope of what you were doing. Well, no, I read the papers, but um, you're a Renaissance man, my friend. I don't know how else to describe it. And potentially Caravaggio, because he was a very sexy guy, right? So I, I thank you for doing this. I'm sorry, I realize it's family day and you've probably got to go for lunch with your either wife and your children and whoever else is involved. But this was an absolute pleasure, Philip, just to get to know you on this level. I, I feel bad. The smart move would have been to play Chicago blues as sort of like yeah. the fade out on this. That would be kind of neat. Um, thank you very much for this. I, I really, um, it was overwhelming to do the research because the sheer breadth and scope of what you do is extraordinary. And like I say, in five years, I would be fascinated to see what you have evolved or well, not well morphed in your case, and whether you're still wearing the same style of clothing, you know. I mean, well, you see, you see where you go. The red you saw the red. No, no, no. Let's think about that. You, purple or pink? You have to make a yeah. statement. Now. You got to move the fashion thing. My friend, thank you very much. I love this. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed being with you. Ken, thank you ever so much. I enjoyed it so much not to talk about dentistry. Absolutely. Uh, dentistry is boring. I mean, it's interesting to talk about what people are doing in dentistry, but part of the game. Yeah. thank you. Have a wonderful day. I apologize for stealing you away from your family. I love and that. I'm going to join Perio Campus. I'll fill out the newsletter request. Come, come to Croatia.
I will and come to. Well, I got to meet Cesiana. I mean, it, it, it's that's next on my list of not my bucket list. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, Filippo. Thank you again. Be well. Bye.